Hi, Paul. Hi, Bob. Hello. Yeah, uh, great sound. Uh, welcome to Quantum Photonics. Uh, we also have Bob here, who is one of our moderators. Hi, Bob. Good afternoon or morning, however it is. Yeah, good as well. So, yeah, um, welcome once again to this uh, uh, very interesting topic that we have now in Quantum Photonics. Um, I would like to bring up their cell before we begin the room to help us uh, open the room. So I'm inviting him up. Uh, welcome, Darcel. Hi. Hello, Cecile, uh, Bob, and Paul. Happy Wednesday to you all. And I guess it's a day or a day ahead. So happy Thursday to you or Wednesday night to you, Cecile. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Likewise, um, yeah, wishing you a good morning. And it's uh, like, uh, what? Is it a good afternoon for you, for you, Paul, or evening? Yeah, it's afternoon, so it's uh, yeah, almost 6 p.m. here. So good afternoon. Paul is in Netherlands, right? No, I'm in Sweden, in Stockholm. Sweden, yeah, in Stockholm. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, this is the second time that uh, Paul will be here and we've got a very interesting topic. So uh, we would now like to um, listen to the music of their cell while we're waiting for more people to come in. Uh, their cell, uh, their cell always helps us open and close the rooms here in quantum photonics, plus uh, many other jobs that are mysterious, aside from him being a filmmaker, a writer, and a composer. So, yeah, their cell, uh, thank you so much. Please welcome our start uh, with your music. Absolutely. Here we go. Cecile, the mic is yours. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, welcome to Quantum Photonics. Uh, thank you, Darcel, for sharing your great music to open the room today. So, um, yeah, we are very glad to have our recurring speaker. We are very honored to um, have Dr. Paul Petrus from Karolinska Institute. Um, Dr. Petrus received his PhD in medicine, focusing on the crosstalk between the metabolism and the epigenetics in the fat cells from the Karolinska Institute uh, 2019 and uh, completed his postdoctoral training in circadian biology and metabolism at the University of California in Irvine. During his postdoc, he studied the mechanisms in which circadian clocks in different organs communicate using metabolic signals. Paul is currently an assistant professor at the Karolinska Institute, leading a group studying the role of circadian rhythms in the pathogenesis of mental and metabolic diseases. His research is funded by the Werner Green Foundations and the Nova Nordisk Foundation. So yeah, I'm very proud to um, introduce to you our very, very special guest, Dr. Paul Petrus. Uh, Paul, hi, and welcome to Quantum Photonics. Hi, Cecil, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very glad to be back here and to get the opportunity to present the research and the concepts my group will focus on these coming years. I will give a short presentation about the topic and the concept that I'm interested in pursuing, and I'll leave plenty of time for the discussion and for the questions from the audience. So I look, really look forward to that. So my group uh, is interested in understanding the link between metabolic dysfunction, such as obesity or diabetes, and the link to mental morbidities, such as depression. And we think that uh, these perturbations uh, are caused by, or at least partially caused by, disruption of our, our internal biological rhythms, that is, circadian rhythms. And the reason I got interested in this topic is because, uh, as Cecil introduced, I did my PhD studying metabolic disease, and I focused on fat cells. And I realized that what happens in the fat cell is very dependent on communication with the brain. So for instance, neurons innervate the fat cells uh, and tell the fat cells when it's time to release the fat that they store inside of them. And the fat cells themselves, they secrete hormones such as leptin that uh, signals back to the brain and regulate appetite. And also, it is the brain that control our behavior that the fat cells needs to comply with in order to maintain uh, energy balance in our bodies. So after my uh, PhD, I continued my research in the field of chronobiology, studying circadian rhythms. Uh, and uh, I also realized that the cause of metabolic disease is tightly linked with what happens in the brain and that the brain is a very important organ controlling our metabolic health. So this is how I decided to, in my own lab, dig deeper into this and understand how mental health and metabolic health is connected to each other. So as probably everybody in the audience know that uh, obesity and mental disorders such as depression are the, one of our most, or it's our most prevalent causes for human suffering in the world. And compared to other diseases such as cardiovascular disease and cancer that are uh, more fatal, causes more of the mortality in the world, uh, what uh, obesity and depression does is that it causes more suffering and uh, it's the cause of the most sickly, for instance, in, in our populations in the world. And in, in fact, uh, this is more relevant now after this COVID pandemic, uh, because we've seen an increase in both these morbidities. So if you go to slide two in the presentation that I think Cecile have attached here, is, is that right, Cecile, it's available or? 
Yeah. So uh, on. It is. I I just uh, took a look at it and it looks great. Thanks, doctor. Perfect. Thank you very much. So if you go to slide two, you can see that there was already high prevalence of both obesity in the left graph and also depression and anxiety disorders in the on the right graph before the pandemic. But we've see, also seen an increase in both childhood obesity and also depression uh, post pandemic. And in fact, both these diseases uh, are prevalent in very young ages. So if you look at depression, we see a peak in prevalence already at 25 years old. And people, individuals are 25 years old. So metabolic diseases and mental disorders are often considered to be two independent morbidities, uh, isolated from each other. But uh, we are starting to understand that these this is not the case and that these two are interconnected with each other. There are epidemiological studies suggesting that having depression increases the risk of developing obesity and the other way around is also true. And at a glance, you might think that it is quite straightforward to find the solution to this. Uh, we just make people lose weight and uh, we'll solve the depression as well or the mental health disorders. But the, the link is more uh, complicated than that. Yeah. And also the most effective treatment of obesity is bariatric surgery. And if you go to slide three, you'll see that in the bottom graph there, is, this is why this link is so uh, complicated between these morbidities. Uh, individuals that undergo bariatric surgery, so they get surgery uh, and they eat less uh, and they'll lose weight. But what happens is that uh, this surgery increases the risk of uh, non-fatal self-harm and even individuals uh, suffer an increased risk of committing suicide, suggesting that the link from mental morbidity to obesity, the, ob the overeating is maybe a way of coping with the mental disorders. And if we look at the other way around, the cause of metabolic morbidity to mental morbidity, we see that it's not just individuals that uh, are overweight or suffering from obesity that uh, become mentally uh, sick. The, the risk of uh, getting depression increases with the number of risk factors you have when you suffer from obesity, so such as weight, big waist circumference or high blood pressure or insulin resistance. And in fact, healthy individuals with obesity do not suffer a higher risk of uh, getting depression. So what this suggests is that there are biological factors with obesity that help drive this um, the progression of depression. And it is not just the social stigma of uh, having or suffering from obesity. So what we're interested in is to understand how these two morbidities are linked to each other. And one way of identifying the common denominator, denominator linking these two together uh, is to look at external factors contributing to development of both these diseases. One such external factor is shift work, which dis disrupts our internal rhythms. And today we live in societies full of factors disrupting our internal rhythms. And in slide four, you can see examples of that. Uh, to the right, there is a satellite picture of the US and the yellow and red color represent artificial light. And you can see that over time we've ha we have more, we've gain more and more artificial light in the US, but this is also true for the rest of the world. And on the right, you have New York, the city that never sleeps. And I don't think that this is new, unique for New York any longer. Most cities in the world have shops and restaurants open 24-7 uh, 
people working with all kinds of different jobs that uh, uh, require shifts, so shift work, so like in the healthcare system, for instance. So how does this impact our health? In slide five, uh, you find two references of meta-analysis that have been uh, done, uh, and it summarized several studies showing that shift work increases the risk of both mental morbidities as well as uh, uh, obesity. Uh, and if, if you look at mouse models, so to show that this is uh, the shift work is a uh, is a cause of uh, both mental morbidity and obesity, you can look at mouse models. So you can simulate the jet lag or shift work paradigm in mice by alternating the light dark cycles. So the mice would um, be active in the dark cycle. So by alternating this, you simulate shift work or jet lag. And you can see in slide six that mice that are exposed to this alternation and uh, and the light schedule gain substantially more weight. And this is uh, true even if they eat uh, the same amount of food as the mice that have consistent light dark cycles. And what's interesting in this study that they did was that they also tried to keep they also kept the uh, availability for food in a third group to the same time point when it's supposed to be dark. And in these mice, they did not gain food. So this has Im implications for in people who work, sh uh, they have shift work, is that um, if you're forced to go to work late at night, try to keep your feeding schedule to your active phase. That is when it's light outside, so your real active phase. Don't shift your uh, feeding when you're supposed to be asleep, is the take-home message. Likewise, jet lag experiments in mice causes depression. So if you go to the next slide, you see a reference for that as well. And in this uh, study, they performed something called the forced swim test in mice that were uh, were exposed to these disrupted light dark cycles. And in the four swim tests, what you do is you take a mouse and you put it in a pool. And uh, the time that it is that the mouse is immobile is a measure of how depressed it is. And you can see in the right graph there that mice that were exposed to disrupted light dark cycles were more immobile, uh, suggesting that uh, jet lag or shift work causes depression. So the goal with our research is to understand which key processes that are involved in linking the circadian disruptions to metabolic and mental disorders. And we will focus on metabolism in my group. And slide eight, you find circus plots representing temporal correlation of specific metabolites between organs. So you have uh, the brain, uh, different brain regions, you have the liver, the serum, the adipose tissue, the fat tissue, several organs. And you can see that each connection between the different tissues is a correlation uh, between a tissue and a specific metabolite. And in the left white box, you can appreciate that high fat diet feeding, which causes obesity, it leads to a large loss of correlations, uh, suggesting that obesity causes a lost temporal coherence and circadian metabolic communication between organs. And we think that this loss of metabolic signaling between the brain and other organs uh, is involved in the disease progression and the comorbidity of mental and metabolic health. And we want to find ways of targeting uh, these pathways and uh, develop new intervention that could uh, be beneficial for individuals working shift or exposing uh, being exposed to jet lag reoccurringly. And to the right, you can see that uh, these circus plots, this analysis have also been performed in mice uh, that were sedentary or um, 
underwent the exercise intervention. And exercise uh, is one way of rewiring and strengthening the temporal coherence uh, and metabolism between organs. And this information could also be mined and used to identify important pathways that could be targeted to treat uh, metabolic and mental disease. So one follow-up question is, what does the metabolite do in the target tissue? And this is also something that we're uh, interested in. And how do they regulate the function in the target tissue? Yeah. There are, of course, many mechanisms involved, but one mechanism that I, I find particularly fascinating is uh, epigenetics. Uh, so epi stands, it means in Latin, on top, and genetics are our genomes, so the, the genes. So it means on top of the uh, genome. So the definition of epigenetics is a process in which the DNA or genome is modified without ch changing the actual code. So no mutation, but modifications on top of the uh, gene. And DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones. And these histones can be modified, which results in an altered 3D structure of the, uh, uh, of the DNA which allow specific genes to be expressed and other to be repressed. And metabolites, uh, so, uh, the chemistry in our body and the, the breakdown of nutrients, can the, these byproducts or, uh, uh, from metabolism can act as substrate for these modifications, the epigenetic modifications, or as cofactors regulating the activity of the writers and erasers that regulate these modifications. And in slide nine, you can find the summary with a uh, nice review, a reference to a nice review that described these processes for the people who are interested in digging deeper in this, uh, in this topic. So what this means is that by disrupting our internal rhythms, we are able to alter the temporal coherence of metabolism between the organs in our body. And what this does to the different tissues, such as the brain or the liver or the fat cells in the body, is that it leads to changes, or it may lead to changes in the DNA structure. Uh, and this will, of course, uh, result in a changed fingerprint of the gene expression in the, in the organ, which also alter their function. So this is the mechanisms we will study in my group to understand how circadian rhythms are linked to metabolic and mental health. And now I'm happy to discuss this further with you and to answer your questions. And thank you for, very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, yeah, um, we also welcome Shara here on stage uh, and uh, Tamar who joined us. So um, yeah, uh, Paul is uh, from, has a lab in Karolinska Institute. And uh, this is the second time had he jo uh, that he had joined us and he's starting a new project about uh, metabolism and mental health, how the circadian rhythm is affecting this. So um, we are opening the floor to the audience to um, ask questions or make comments. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, we will bring you up the stage if you have questions. Um, yeah, so um, before I give the mic to um, other speakers here on stage, uh, Paul, I would just like to um, ask uh, you a question. Uh, of course, you know the study that you will be having about metabolism and mental health um, as affected by circadian rhythm. Um, you're going to um, dive further into that, right, by uh, emerging on another study um, that you have. So uh, do you, did you have, do you also have an intuition as to how intervention could be done, for example, if for instance, um, like the shift workers who are not able to change the um, 
the time of their work on how we are able to do interventions or try to mitigate their situation so that they will not be greatly affected by uh, the circadian rhythm yeah so uh, i mean for for obesity uh, i think this and it's also shown by other studies that keeping your feeding rhythms at the same time points is beneficial for not gaining gaining weight. Uh, we don't know the processes for uh, the mental health or the connection be between these two. But well, we're um, and exercise is also a very good intervention to protect the mental health and also obesity. So these are known intervention. But what we're trying to understand is to isolate. Uh, so if you look at the circus plots. We want to understand which of these connections that are more important uh, than others. And we think that the tryptophan pathway is particularly important. It's re it regulates, so removing, we've shown that removing tryptophan from the diet is um, altering the circadian rhythms in, in mice, at least. And there is also uh, studies, uh, actually also from Karolinska Institute, uh, that shown that a, a well exercised or a healthy muscle is metabolizing tryptophan in a different way so that uh, the compounds in the tryptophan pathway cannot enter the brain and cause neuroinflammation, which in turn leads to depression. So we think that the tryptophan pathway is interesting, but we're also interested in finding other specific metabolic pathways that one could um, target specifically in individuals that work, uh, have shift works that forced to work at specific times to sort of try to rewire their um, metabolism back so that it's coherent between the different tissues. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, maybe later on I will ask you about your comment on intermittent fasting. And another thing, that's why I'm asking these questions about shift workers, because as you know, in Asia, for example, like in the Philippines, we have an office who's, who is doing business process outsourcing, and basically they are 24 hours, and there are different shifts. And so it has an impact on how employers are also trying to take care of the well-being of their employees. And uh, basically, since there are different time zones uh, they have to go 24 hours and yeah also in the production lines as well so it has an impact as well as to how the insurance system would be able to deal uh, with the insurance so i think your study will be very important on that so um yeah um i would like to give the mic to bob or shara or tamar who are here on stage and anyone uh, who is in the audience you're welcome to uh, come up and ask questions. So, yeah, uh, Bob or Tamar? Yes, uh, both very interesting your research and, well, I have a lot of questions here, but um, um, it, it's very interesting that uh, if you relate the, the sun as one important uh, important uh, font to uh, fit vitamin D and you relate it with uh, the, the virus. Um, I was thinking about uh, it's okay, it's possible. I don't know if in your research uh, you achieved some uh, databases um, that it's a little bit related with Cecil, uh, Cecilia um, a question about um, which are the other treatments that is possible make it um, simulating light or um, with some um, artificial synthetic uh, treatments to try to stabilize. And I don't know if you um, achieved to the consequences of protein uh, spike. Uh, it's more about it because if uh, people have this work that they do at night and uh, their levels of uh, vitamin D, it's uh, very low. Uh, if synthetically it's enough or 
this, this have a relation with obesity too. Um, if you can talk a little bit about it, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. I, that's a very good point because what we, I mean, vitamin D is, um, vitamin D metabolism is the mo most well studied uh, metabolic pathway of how light is regulating our physiology. But vitamin D is just one of the things that light does uh, to our body. So uh, I do not think that taking vitamin D supplements is enough to uh, mimic what light does. Uh, so our internal rhythms is, I didn't uh, go through that um, in this presentation, but I did it in my last presentation. Um, I just wanted to save uh, time, that's why, for the discussion. But what the light also does is that it synchronizes our molecular clock in our body and it targets the clock in the brain a region called the suprachiasmatic nucleus which is where the eyes are connected to our brain and these the, this molecular clock in turn will have multiple physiological functions uh, in our body so vitamin d supplements will not uh, are not able to synchronize uh, the molecular clock uh, like light does and also another uh, external factor also linked to Cecil's question or comment about intermittent fasting another potent uh, synchronizer of our internal clocks is feed, food intake so food is able to synchronize uh, our internal clock as well but we what we don't know is uh, which of these two factors are causing a disruption? Is it because they come at different time points or is it that because we shift them back and forward? So that is something we're interested in uh, dissecting. Um, I mean, there is uh, evidence from this reference that I have in my presentation by other, by other references as well, that keeping the feeding window at the same time every day uh, will be beneficial. So if you're forced of going to work at night, try to not eat during that shift and then go and eat breakfast before you go to bed and take a nap and start your day over again and keep keep a consistent feeding intake. And same with the light exposure. If you're working shift, try to um, expose yourself to as little light as possible uh, during the night and then expose yourself to as much light as possible uh, when when you're supposed to be awake I mean one one uh, uh, again coming back to the tryptophan pathway which is an, an amino acid one study for instance showed that light exposure uh, early on during the day combined with the tryptophan supplement increases the uh, melatonin, the uh, hormone that help us uh, wind down and go to sleep during the night. It increases the levels of melatonin uh, more than just taking tryptophan itself. So the, the best strategy we have right now for uh, shift workers is to try to keep your light exposure and food intake uh, Consist at consistent time. So when you're forced to go to work, don't expose yourself to too much artificial light and try to not eat. I hope that answered your question. Could, could I, uh, this is John, I just joined the stage and I... I Hello, John. Yeah, hi, I, I just joined the conversation listening about 10 minutes ago. So you may have already covered this, but um, from a teleological perspective, most of human evolution, the vast majority of our genome uh, and our microbiome has evolved around eat when you, when you can because you may not have a meal for another day or two. And, you know, the, the, all the studies on intermittent fasting. Um, and so I can see where in the context of uh, mental health disorders, some more regularity uh, may be advantageous but 
I, I, my, my suspicion is that from a teleological perspective, um, regular meal times, um, other than being diurnal versus nocturnal. Um, I think obviously that's programmed into our genetic code pretty intensively, whether we're a diurnal or a nocturnal species, and we're obviously diurnal. But um, the the question I have is, do we really believe that other than um, ensuring that con- the consistency is alignment of meals with sleep-wake cycles, is, is there much more to the timing than that alone um, that is wired into our uh, metabolic system? Yeah, so um, if I understood your questions correctly, it is if it's the relationship between the sleep cycles and food intake more important than having it consistently uh, at the specific time of the day. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. From a teleologic perspective. Yeah. So um, our internal, so our molecular clock is very robust. That's why when you travel, it takes some time to uh, reset your um, uh, new circadian rhythm to the new time zone. Uh, so having a shift, so even if you sleep at a different time point, a couple of days, if you're uh, if you have a job that requires shift work, your molecular clock will take longer time to reset. And what this means is that the transcriptional fingerprints, so the genes that are expressed that are involved in metabolizing food and uh, regulating all different aspects of your physiology will will not be linked to your sleep cycle if it's disrupted at a couple of days so that's that's theoretically why uh, why we think that keeping the same time point with food intake uh, consistent even if you're uh, sleeping at a different time a couple of days uh, so, uh, and that there is a, in the presentation that's attached, there is one reference uh, there supporting these uh, uh, this claim where mice were exposed to a disrupted light dark schedule but kept their food intake at the same time and they did not uh, gain weight uh, compared to the mice that got food ad libitum, which means that they had food available throughout the day. And we're exposed to the same disruption of uh, the light dark cycle. But also, I, uh, to just comment on your first comment that we're uh, we've evolved to eat when there is food available. That is true, but we still do have uh, processes in our body that regulate the. Uh, uh, the feed fasting, so we uh, we get hungry at specific times uh, every day, and our circadian clock is, helps us regulate that. And disruption of the circadian clock could also uh, disrupt this behavior. Uh, a couple of years ago, there were uh, a couple of studies showing that the dopaminergic system is involved in this. So the clock system and neurons that release dopamine regulate um, hedonic feeding behavior and right now so we eat not because we're hungry but because we want to feel pleasure Uh, and now we have so much food that gives us pleasure in our society so maybe that that process is disrupted in our brains and that's one of the reasons why our circadian clock might be disrupted by this environment that we've created, the societies that we live in. Yeah, so uh, we have here on stage uh, Jose and yeah, uh, also Ryan, welcome on stage. So, so um, yeah, I have a question later in behalf of Ryan. So um, also um, later on, I will request Bob to read some questions that are in the room chat. I have invited Alma and also Jessica, but maybe they could not come up. So I will ask Bob to read it later. In the meantime, uh, Jose, you are on stage. Would you like to speak? 
Yes, thank you, Cecil. Uh, well, unfortunately, I haven't been here since the beginning. Uh, I don't know if you have already talked about this, but I have a question, and the question is, uh, there are uh, disparity, disparities between uh, countries where are located in the Equatorial line and other countries, because I was listening to you talking about the internet clock, the internal clock and how it works with the uh, with the sun, I mean, with the light and the dark. And so I don't know if there are studies that show is this uh, difference or not, or there there are not so much big difference. Uh, I mean, uh, with uh, metabolic and mental disorders. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I live in uh, Sweden, which is very high up north and. Uh, you can, uh, there is definitely uh, fluctuations in people's mood um, in the different seasons so, uh, of the year. And there is also studies showing that the, uh, the prevalence of uh, suicide increase actually when it's starting to get light again, when, if, when it's been dark for a while and then starting so around spring here in, in Sweden there is an increase in uh, the rate of suicide so yeah there is uh, some evidence that suggests that this is uh, uh, it is probably healthier to live near the equator uh, and have consistent light dark cycles compared to uh, the shifts in the light dark cycles that we experience here up in the north and in countries that are very low down south. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Jose. So um, Alma is here uh, now on stage. Uh, I, I don't know, Ryan, if you want to ask a question. Well, before we go to Alma, um, uh, I just want to uh, ask you, Paul, earlier, if I think you mentioned something about the effect of the cir circadian rhythm in diabetes. Um, can you elaborate more? Yeah, so we, uh, what we've seen is that um, uh, shift and shift workers and disruption of the circadian clock uh, increases the risk of uh, developing diabetes and the um, I mean diabetes is a problem with metabolizing uh, glucose and the circadian clock is tightly linked with uh, metabolism so if you uh, remember my last part in my presentation talking about uh, how metabolism control epigenetics so the gene expression of uh, different genes we have uh, the clock system is actually a reader and writer of the epigenome and it's dependent of uh, uh, of metab uh, metabolism so having a metabolic disease such as diabetes would disrupt uh, the the circadian clock and there was uh, a study, uh, studies done here in Karolinska as well, showing that diabetic patients have disrupted circadian rhythms in their muscles, for instance. So there is a, there is definitely potential to uh, find therapeutics to against diabetes or for diabetes uh, targeting the circadian clock. Wow, oh, I, I was unaware. Thank you, Cecile, for, for asking and, and readdressing that. And, and thank you, Paul, for, for sharing that. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, so now we have uh, Alma here on stage. Uh, she was having questions of the room chat. So, Alma, uh, you're welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to know if you can elaborate on how night shifters um, get you know, how do they get affected by you know by not having that they mostly will sleep all day so they don't have access mostly to the daylight uh, and they are bright light all night taking care of patients so how will that affect their mental health and also their like regular health thank you 
Yeah, so I mean, of course, uh, shift work is uh, is very different uh, depending on what kind of job you have and uh, the different expo and how how often you work that that shift. So that will have an impact. Uh, uh, what we know is that shift work does affect both ment- mental and metabolic health. So I think that uh, if you work nighttime. Uh, every day and you're asleep every day when it's supposed to be light outside my recommendation would be to expose yourself to as much light as possible uh, when you're awake and eat during that time of course as well and then uh, do the i mean not expose yourself to light when uh, when it's daylight outside when you're sleeping so i think it is the uh, keeping the exposures to these i mean they're called side givers who comes from german means time givers uh, so the these time givers which we know is ac- physical activity light and food i think the key is to keep these consistent and if you don't you're suffering an increased risk of developing both mental and metabolic uh, disease i hope that was an answer for your question Yes, thank you. And I would like to know if you have any suggestions of what can be done while you're a night shifter to decrease those risks. Yes, so it would be to um, avoid uh, food intake if you're uh, if you're alternating by working a few days per week or every once in a while shifting back and forward. Um, it would be to uh, fast, not eat during your night shift, and uh, not exposing yourself to too much uh, light. And one way of uh, synchronizing your body back to the normal cycle when you're back is to exercise. That would be uh, that is also a side giver. We know that physical activity is. Uh, uh, yeah, is uh, a synchronizer of our internal rhythm as well. Thanks. Yes, so uh, yeah, there are questions here on the room chat. I, w- I would like to pass the mic to Bob, if Bob would like to read some questions. I had invited Jessica up on stage, but she can't come, so maybe Bob can read some uh, her question. I I will do that next. However, I have a personal question. Do you have a term for people whose rhythms are flipped, like myself? I I I never slept as a kid or an adult, and now I'm retired. I don't sleep now. I've always worked nights, 52 years at night. So, do you have a term for that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not aware of a, a term for that, but uh, the, there is a term for uh, <laughs> there is a term for people. So this is not sleep is not my uh, area of research. There is uh, sleep is something regulated by the circadian clock, but it's not um, circadian rhythms. It's it, Let's say it's, uh, the, the clock is not only regulating sleep. Uh, I'm focused on the metabolic side, but sleep is the output from the, uh, the circadian clock. And I've uh, um, talked to a researcher that studied sleep, and she's specifically interested in so-called short sleepers, uh, short sleepers, people that don't need that much sleep, and they. Uh, Maybe it's a bit anecdotal, but she claims that uh, they are unique in many other ways as well. Maybe that's true for you, Bob, as well, that uh, they have a high pain tolerance, for instance, and they're usually quite optimistic. I don't know if it's (laughs) true for you as well. Maybe you're just a short sleeper. Uh, All of the above is true for me. Uh, Last night, three hours, that's about average. Oh, that's, and are you optimistic and do you have a high pain tolerance? Um, absolutely. Uh, I've had 2,000 stitches. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, she studies the genetics behind it. So uh, uh, she thinks it's, uh, uh, it's inherited, it's genetic. I don't know if maybe your, do you have parents that, uh, that were similar, that slept little? Not at all. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, short sleepers. You could look into look into that and read more about it. So I don't want to hijack the content for for my purposes. So uh, I do have a couple of things in the back channel that I wanted to roll out. If this is a good time. Yeah. Okay. So um, from the water fast warrior, the question. Does circadian rhythm impact glyphatic system function? Yes. So there is uh, uh, a research. Uh, now I forgot her name, but yeah, there is a, uh, a research group that studies that specifically, the circadian regulation of the glymphatic system. So yeah, the, uh, I think that it, I mean, it's, uh, Maybe difficult to separate that from sleep because sleep is important for the lymphatic system as well. Um, but yeah, there is a is a link there definitely. Okay, so the next question comes from Sala. Is there melatonin without an assistant like magnesium uh, effective? Yeah, uh, melatonin is um, will help. I mean, it helps us go to sleep. It's a hormone that is uh, produced in the pineal gland in our brain, uh, and uh, it, the stimulation of melatonin production in our body increases when we're not exposed to light. Uh, and taking supplements will, uh, on the short term, help you. Uh, sleep uh, even without magnesium but i think one should be careful with melatonin supplements first because it's not well regulated the i mean the food supplement industry in general is not well regulated so you don't know how much melatonin you'll get in that pill uh, and secondly um, we don't know if the body produces a um, resistance to, when you when you take melatonin supplements there is a risk of inhibiting your own production of melatonin then you're sort of dependent on the on the supplement actually i think it's contraindicated before 40 the melatonin hormones sorry can you say that again yeah i think uh, you shouldn't take melatonin before 40 you know so because it could it, I mean, it could be bad for your internal clock or your internal process or sleeping or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I would uh, uh, I would uh, f try to get as much light as possible early on and then expose yourself to darkness and that will boost your own melatonin production. So oh, I, I want to step back at this point and recognize LT, who might have a question for you. I do. Thank you, Bob, <laughs> for having me up this year, and the, of course, uh, the speaker Paul. You know, you always put up a good rooms and and uh, topics. My question relates to, uh, yes, circadian rhythm is definitely, but the recognize and slightly the people like Bob is one extreme. So probably adapt well, and uh, my question related to um, population genetic point of view. Does the um, people in the uh, what do you call that? You bring up Sweden, right? Sweden. Correct. Yeah. Sp yeah. Yeah. So they have a much longer exposure. Oh no, short opposite, short exposure to the sun, so they get a more um, therapy prescribed to them in the winter time so winter blue relates 
So is there any generic, like a pop, and you, I send you your panel because I came a little bit late, I'm sorry, I missed. You, ha, you have a list, a long list, so you're finding that. Is that population differences from Sweden people versus others part of the world? Like, that's my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, there is uh, an, uh, it was an animal species. It was a recent study showing that, um, I I don't remember the study now, so I I would you need to look this up. Uh, but it was uh, some animal species with, that exists near the equator. I think it was bird, some kind of bird, and also. Uh, uh, the ones that were higher up north, that they had evolved to um, uh, their their internal clock was more sensitive to light, and there was some genetic component to that. I don't remember the study well, so you need to uh, look that up. But other than that, I mean, uh, a dark skin and light skin is so people living far up in the north have light skin, and that. Uh, uh, at least for vitamin D production, but uh, I'm, uh, I think also for other uh, physiological effects that light has, I think having a light skin makes you more uh, susceptible to uh, light exposure. So uh, maybe it is the color of our skin and the color of our eyes that uh, oh, thank what's you. different. People yeah. near, yeah, the big waiter and up yes. north. Yes, I'll look it up. But up yeah. north, you, you can confirmation that there is some kind of adaptation or a change modified um, yeah. modification in that. Okay. And then, then another I, question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, ju I just want to, sorry to interrupt you. I just want to uh, continue on that. It's actually a quite interesting uh, comment. So, what we have in Sweden is that we've had uh, a lot of immigration. So, people. Uh, moving to Sweden from uh, East Africa, uh, for instance, and what what we've seen is that th these population in Sweden have uh, the prevalence of autism is higher um, uh, in this population in Sweden. And if you look at this population in their home countries, there is not an increased prevalence of autism. So. It could be a, a link to light there and how uh, well their bodies can handle these long dark periods up north. That's me. Yeah, which, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. which, which home countries? Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, East Africa, Somalia, for instance, and people oh, yeah, from. Yeah, Som yeah, Somalia has an incredibly high uh, incidence and prevalence of autism, and I don't know that it's not due to ascertainment bias because the Somali population in Southern California, which is, you know, uh, Stockholm, Southern California, Minneapolis, St. Paul, are the three sort of major emigration centers for Somalis. Um, right. They all have very high incidence of autism. So I don't think it's latitudinal or light influence. Okay. I think, I think it's ascertainment bias and it's just not diagnosed in Somalia where, it's been a dumping ground of uh, toxic wastes from uh, China and other countries for many, many decades, which is how the whole uh, piracy movement in Somalia emerged out of vigilantes protecting their fisheries and their shores from toxic dumping. I see, yeah. So thanks for highlighting that. I did not know that. Yeah, so maybe it's not uh, light in these in individuals then. But that's something to pay attention. I mean, at least the thinking in the linkage wise, because I was going to ask, have there any like migration, you know, people migrated and then you start off with the South Africa and then Somalia and then China. So it's like a big movement, you know, like a, a immigrant to a different totally environment that, that affects their epigenetic, I guess I was, I was going to say. Yeah, you okay, know, I think, yeah. thank you. I think that is a, uh, uh, I don't think it's been studied, uh, and uh, it could be a good thing and a good opportunity for me living here up north to study exactly that. So, yeah, thanks for bringing, up, bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Elti. 
Um, so uh, we have Rishi who joined us on stage. I wonder if he has a question. Uh, meanwhile, uh, maybe I, I don't know, Bob, if we have more questions on the room chat that hasn't been read yet. So Yes, I do. Yeah, okay. Uh, so if you'd like to read that, then later on I have a question to Paul again. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, but, 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 but. Yeah, I'm looking for one in the early part that I, I thought. Um, maybe while you're looking yeah. for the question, may yeah, I sure. ask Paul uh, some question? Uh, Paul, uh, do you think that uh, um, what is the effect of, I think we discussed it in the previous room, but I would like to recall what is the effect of the circadian rhythm in the different organs that we have, because I seem to have read that, you know, uh, they were observing maybe some liver organ um, that were in its, uh, it was prepared for transplant and they they were studying the effect of circadian rhythm on that. Do you have some, um, did you come across some um, information or study on that? Yeah, so what we know is that uh, the different organs in our body are um, susceptible to, um, or the clock and the different organs in our bodies are susceptible to different stimuli. So for instance, if you give uh, food during, if you, if you invert the light schedule with the food intake, so food is given during the rest phase, uh, then the liver clock will adjust to the food intake while the clock in the brain will continue oscillating uh, in synchrony with the light-dark cycles. Uh, and many other organs will not be susceptible to uh, food intake. And a recent study from a group in Israel showed that the liver clock is actually protecting uh, organs in other bodies, uh, sorry, or, uh, the other organs in the body from these uh, untimely food insults, one could say. So if you eat at the wrong time, the liver clock is supposed to be there and protect you because what they did was that they knocked out, they uh, deleted the clock in the liver, and what they saw was that other organs, such as the lung, the circadian clock over there started to synchronize to the uh, food intake. So it is a very complicated network, uh, I would say. But, uh, yeah, it, it's a... Uh, and, and we don't know if it's the... Uh, if it's the disruption of the clock system and the different organs at uh, like synchronizing them back and forward, or if it's the exposure of the different stimuli at different time points. If you expose to light and eat during the night, if that is the cause of uh, disease. So that is, uh, that is something that we need more research in to understand how these different stimuli regulate our physiology and how they uh, are involved in developing diseases. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, so, Bob, did, did you see your question already? Yes, I did. This comes to us from Jessica. She asks that, is inflammation the or a link or possible link between unrecognized depression and unexplainable pain. And her example is a teen with unexplainable back pain. Could this be emotional distress? Thank you. Yeah, so inflammation is something that uh, we think is uh, one factor linking the metabolic and mental health. So. Inflammation is involved in developing depression, chronic uh, inflammation. And it's also uh, in obesity, for instance, we see that the fat tissue has a chronic secretion of pro-inflammatory factors. So that could be, I, I'm not a clinician, so I can't tell her about uh, her back pain. But there is definitely a link. Inflammation is a link between the peripheral organs and the brain uh, 
definitely. So uh, uh, if you have uh, obesity, if you suffer from obesity, you'll have a higher rate of uh, inflammation in your fat tissue, liver, and muscle. And this, uh, these pro-inflammatory factors may enter the brain and um, cause inflammation in the brain as well, which is linked to depression. And again, the best way of uh, that we know of to prevent this uh, pro-inflammatory response in the brain is physical exercise. So, um, and uh, one mechanism that we've uh, well, that we know or that have been shown is the regulation of the tryptophan pathway. So, when you exercise, your muscles will uh, increase the expression of a transcription factor, a protein that reads genes called PGC1 alpha. And among the genes that it regulates are uh, enzymes involved in tryptophan metabolism. So they convert a metabolite called kynurenin to kynurenic acid. And when it's converted to the acidic form, it will not cross the blood-brain barrier and it can't enter the brain uh, and it will uh, protect the brain against uh, neuroinflammation. And uh, inflammation, that's another interesting point, is that inflammation itself is involved in regulating the, the clock system. Uh, so having inflammation is not necessarily a bad thing. Inflammation is important. It's an important process for our bodies. It's, the problem is when you lose the lose the temporal regulation of inflammation so that it, it is chronic, and it's the chronic inflammation that is... Um, detrimental right, thank you Beth. thank you so we have uh, um we have uh nama club who um raised his hand but i don't know if he's on stage already i tried to bring him up can you see him bob or rishi do you have a question first um, yes, I, I'd like to ask, um, do you have any um, suggestions for how we could better manage our circadian rhythms and eating cycles? Uh, for example, um, I mean, uh, things like, I, I think, don't look at screens for half an hour before you go to bed uh, because blue light disturbs your circadian rhythm. And if, if there's things that you might be able to teach us, thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, the, it goes back to the regular stuff. That, I mean, I know that it is difficult, uh, especially if you work shift, to uh, to maintain that. Is uh, what we know for sure is light, uh, consistent light exposure or the light dark uh, schedules. I would say uh, consistent uh, feeding windows uh, and exercise. So this is something I really want to uh, look into in my own research is to identify the specific pathway, the central pathway, so that one could create specific interventions and maybe even personalized interventions where you could target the key pathways that are involved in regulating uh, our circadian clock and circadian rhythms and give these um, interventions or uh, even if it's drugs or interventions to to individuals that uh, have a shift work so this is something we're hoping to look into but uh, it's too early to uh, say that something other than consistent food intake and light exposure and exercise is effective I, I just had a comment for Nama. Uh, I'm not able to bring you up on stage. If you leave the room and come back in, it'll probably reset your status, and then we'll be able to do that. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, um, Paul, I would like to ask about your upcoming work. Uh, do you have an estimated time as to when you will be able to get the results in your design of the new experiments? Yeah, so it's uh, right now I'm in the process of uh, hiring people. So if there is uh, any uh, PhDs that are interested in, uh, in researching in this, please contact me. Uh, 
and we could uh, talk. But yeah, the estimated uh, time frame is within five years. Where um, that's when we're uh, we're hoping to get uh, getting these projects uh, done. So I have a, f- a few projects. Um, one focusing on how different stimuli like light exposure and food intake is uh, uh, regulating the uh, mental health and metabolic health. And with that, it involves to identify the important pathways uh, that are involved in this connection and manipulate them. Could I ask a yeah. question about um, the uh, any clocks and research in the renal domain. Is there any evidence that renal dysfunction leads to disruption of circadian rhythms that could further amplify and accelerate the progression of uh, the underlying kidney disease so it becomes a vicious cycle of of dysrhythmia um, and progression of kidney disease? Are there any organ systems like the kidney where there's evidence for that? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not aware about any studies showing the link to uh, renal to yeah to kidneys or kidney uh, dysfunction. By uh, uh, for uh, I mean the the kidney or the uh, is where cortisol is uh, released. So I'm sure that there would be. Uh, links to to circadian rhythms but not i can't uh, think of any specific studies uh, right now okay. may i ask another question um yeah okay uh, about the clock genes is how big is the family in a human i know you, you mentioned about animals but in the humans how, how yeah like so two, uh, how many members thank you yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the core clock machinery consists of um, its four members, one could say. So the two activators, which is a clock and BMAL1. So these two uh, heterodimerize, so they bind to each other and uh, then bind to specific regions in the, on the DNA called EBOX element and transcribe thousands of genes in different tissues. And among these genes uh, uh, are the PER and CRI. So there's uh, three different PER genes and two different CRI genes, and these are their own repressors. And when these accumulate in the cytosol, uh, they will go back into the nucleus of the cell and repress the activators clock and BMAL1. And this cycle takes about 24 uh, hours to complete. So that's the core clock machinery. But then we have several other loops that's also involved in maintaining this. So uh, we have the reverb, um, the uh, roar, uh, the roar uh, protein, uh, the roar genes. So it's uh, there's several loops, and I. Uh, it's maybe i mean it's hundreds of genes involved in different aspects of uh, of circadian rhythms but at its core it's clock and bmr1 and cry and purse so it's like five six right you can get a timer and then, yeah thank you yeah <laughs> okay i have something from the back channel uh, Waterfast Warrior has posted a link to a Swedish study on vitamin deficiency, and it it's not exactly point on, but it might be of interest to you folks if you haven't been there to to check it out. I'll I'll look it up definitely. Thanks for sharing that. So, uh, Paul, do you think that uh, one approach maybe of your study or is there a study now that uh, because basically we live in like, you know, a 24-hour world and sometimes if we could not avoid that, is there a way to mimic artificial light 
so that it has the effect of natural light. Yeah, I think there is. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I'm not uh, getting any financial support of this so I, <laughs> from Philips, but I think Philips has a desk lamp uh, which mimics the uh, sunrise, give bright light, and then mimics the uh, sunset. And this could be um, beneficial if you, like me, live up in the north to have a lamp like that at your desk. Or even if you live, you know, in California or where you have bright light, many of us work in an office all day. Uh, and it, it could be a good way of um, uh, to synchronize your internal rhythm by having a lamp like that. There, I, here in Sweden, we also have uh, rooms with uh, light therapy, so you can go and pay a small fee and sit in a room with very bright lights. But uh, regular like office uh, artificial lightning uh, is not, if you, if you take a lux meter to measure the intensity of the light, uh, it's much weaker uh, than going outside. Even on a cloudy day, it's much bright, brighter outside uh, compared to inside an office with a with artificial light on. Yeah, um, yeah thank you, uh, Paul. Um, so we have here Shirash who came up on stage. Shirash? Yeah, Shirash, are you? Oh, um. Hello. Uh, hello. hello. Yes. Uh, hi, Paul, and hello, everyone. So what I wanted to say is that I have been diagnosed with ADHD, realizing I totally agree with what the title of this room states. And I feel that my sleeping patterns are like totally, they're chaotic. I don't have any sleeping mechanism inside of me. I just not know how to sleep or when to sleep. It comes and goes randomly and there's no pattern to it. Like I have not been, I'm not able to really figure out what is going on because it's just very, you know, random. And I, and I, uh, you know, since I started taking uh, the, you know, the medication. Uh, Shirash, Alan, please come closer to the microphone. Can you hear? Yes, that's better. Okay, so what I was saying is that ever since I started taking Ritalin, you know, it's a medication for ADHD, it has substantially, you know, significantly improved my sleeping patterns. Like I'm able to sleep at normal, you know, at normal time, like, uh, you, know, in the, you know, 10, 10 p.m. or something like that. But as soon as I stop taking it, I lose my ability to regulate my sleep. And it also comes with a host of other problems, like I have, you know, when I'm not taking Ritalin, I have more anxiety and I have more problems with my sleeping, you know, pattern. So, so yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing that. So, the, um, the working hypothesis for uh, my research is that uh, disruption is that the circadian clock is the common denominator for metabolic and mental disorders so if you would uh, have a factor dis disrupting your uh, mental function that would also target the the circadian clock and link it to uh, metabolic disease so in your case is that uh, it's maybe not the circadian clock that causes your uh, uh, mental morbidities. Uh, it could be that the other way around. I'm not a clinician again. I just want to say that, so um, I'm not giving any specific advice. But that 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 could be a possibility. And when you take your medication uh, uh, to to reverse the uh, Oh, to target your mental uh, problems that would in turn target the circadian clock and allow you to have normal rhythms and also regulate your sleep. It's definitely a possibility. Yeah. There's also one thing, Paul, that I have observed is that, you know, if I'm 
getting into a lot of physical activity, like uh, something that keeps me, you know, that keeps my mind off the anxious thoughts that I'm not diverting my mind towards a particularly anxious state. But I'm actively going out, doing swimming, going out with my friends, you know, doing a lot of physical work, not having, you know, uh, not uh, going inside my own mind. I find that that also is able to improve sleep. Any thoughts on that or how that happens? Yeah, no, again, the, uh, I mean, physical exercise, I think, if you could uh, uh, take the health benefits that physical exercise does and put it in a pill, I think we would be able to get rid of most other medicines uh, in the world. Uh, there is, I don't think it's only that you get your mind off um, other things that uh, when you exercise, the exercise has a physiological effect on your body, and this physiological effect would also be beneficial for your brain. Uh, and as I mentioned before, for instance, by reducing the inflammation in the brain, and that will in turn also have an impact on your uh, circadian clock, your central clock in the, in the brain. And possibly help with uh, your sleeping schedules. Yeah, thanks again for sharing, sharing that. Um, I think somebody um, was asking a question of the room chat. Can the circadian rhythm affect seasonal affective disorder? Did you answer that earlier already, Paul? Yeah, I think the in the in the north the, we see that the I mean the rate of depression and um, and other affective disorders are uh, influenced by the seasons. Uh, and the the photo period, so the amount, the shifts between light and dark cycles uh, could be involved in regulating this. I just also want to add, then related to that, that uh, light also uh, regulate uh, mood, also independently of the circuit by synchronizing the circadian flux. So uh, our eyes connect to the brain to the SCN where the central clock is located but it's also connected to the habinula which uh, regulate our mood uh, as well so yeah yeah well uh, talking about that what can you say about the uh, you know light therapy yeah i think i mean uh, i think it's up to uh, each and everybody some people might it might not be light that is the problem but it's definitely something that one should uh, one should try if, uh, uh, and that could help you physiologically. I mean, light is, uh, light is a nutrient for our bodies, it's just as important that it is to expose yourself for vitamins and um, uh, other nutrients. Light exposure is also something that is important. And if you, if you have health problems and you're also not exposed to enough light, maybe it's uh, a good thing to try light therapy. If, if I could interject something here, uh, there isn't a light. Uh, light comes in different color temperatures and um, certain uh, wavelengths will affect you in one way and others not. So what I'm suggesting is if you want to go after this, you, you want to have a, a light temperature. This is these Kelvin of 5600 or higher, like up to 6400. Um, that, that will give you very, very close to what we experience as natural daylight. Whereas tungsten, the, the lower levels, they'll keep you up instead of put you to sleep. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, I think the, the best way would be to, exactly like you said, Bob, mimic the colors that, uh, that we see on sunrise and sunset. Um, and also we, we do know that blue light, for instance, light and 
uh, blue wave uh, wavelengths uh, is what our photoreceptors in the eye are most sensitive to, and that will uh, are, they are potent synchronizers of our central clock. Okay, thanks for adding that, Bob. Yeah, I think there are new lights and new colors that um, are coming up that hasn't been discovered yet. Then I think we'll be having a speaker who's going to talk about, you know, breaking that 100-year barrier about the, the, the dimensions and intensities of light that we haven't seen yet. And I also saw a research about lasers on the way they try to project light in a very, very... Um, small um, adjustments that uh, they are going to adjust that now and so maybe that has implications to um, future studies that uh, um, there may be about light therapy so i just also want to ask you paul um, since uh, you say that probably circadian rhythms will also affect uh, um, depression um, so collectively um, especially now that um, among the uh, many um, people, the Gen C and uh, um, the Gen A, there are um, millennials also, there are many um, depression cases, uh, remarkable depression cases. So that uh, in that case, are there studies that you have seen on how they are going to make interventions? Like, for example, are there collected data, empirical data that they have uh, trying to link this uh, uh, depression to circadian rhythm? And because of that, are there recommendations from those who are making the studies or the ones uh, doing the use case of the studies on how to um, try to avoid that, to prevent this or um, create some therapy? Yeah, so uh, actually the, uh, the research on... Uh, disrupted circadian rhythms and depression I, uh, is surprisingly uh, underdeveloped. So there is a lot that needs to be done uh, there uh, that we don't uh, know of. And w when it comes to young, the younger population as well, what is the uh, causing factor in, in these population and how much does disruption of circadian rhythmicity contribute which we don't know we need to uh, understand this we, we know that shift work and this was i mean recently well summarized in a meta-analysis uh, that shift work is disrupting for for our, uh, our mental health and, and depression and it's something that yeah we we need more research there uh, that's what, what the answer is. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, because I was thinking that, um, of course, you know, usually what is being accused is that, um, of course, our societies are exposed to more light. And what are these kinds of light? These are phones and probably maybe um, yeah, video games, which are pre which is prevalent yeah, among the younger population and even to us. And uh, um, usually these are blamed for uh, suicide or uh, depression that's happening. But what is the real cause of this depression? I'm just, you know, it's just something that came up to my mind. Is it because uh, we are more exposed to light or is it because we have so many activities going on in our brain where we, we are being stimulated by this um, exposures and yeah th that's what I'm thinking if uh, um, connected to that if uh, um, light has an effect actually which is disrupting our circadian rhythm so I think they're, they deserve some kind of study because it will create a very important intervention as you see a lot of universities who are um, the um, drug stores of the universities um, are running out in, of uh, yeah. uh, medicines. If you go to um, the this, this drug stores near the universities, it's uh, they always run out of medicines for depression. So they say, of course, this is uh, like a modern epidemic. But however, what is really the cause of that? You know. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point. So is it? Uh when uh, adolescents look in their phone and in social media, I mean, the, the environment for humans is much more complex than 
what we can do in uh, in mice and controlled mice. So we don't know if it is the activity in social media, like you said, or if it's uh, the light from the phone, or maybe both that causes the depression. But so that's why it, it is a good thing that uh, we have these animal models that we can study uh, these in, and then we could isolate. Uh, what is the effect of light specifically? And go, going back to Bob's comment about different colors, I mean, this hasn't been done, so we, we don't know how does different uh, wavelengths of light, how does that affect our mood? Uh, if you're just exposed to one color and not the other, does that affect your brain different, differently? So there is, yeah, I have a lot of work to do, <laughs> we can say that. So I, uh... What got very interested in a collection of articles that I came across a few years ago that said that uh, the, the genes that we ended up with through mating with Neanderthals over 100,000 years ago um, uh, are genes that, because they were in Europe 300,000 years ago, whereas we didn't come to Europe until 100,000 years ago, so they were already pre-adapted to deal with changes over the course of the year in the daylight and in the um, length of the day and in the um, temperature. And so these genes um, cause us to become readying ourselves at a certain level to deal with and conquer these kinds of environmental rhythms that have to do, that were, that were present in the European environment, that were not present in the in the more in the African environment from which they had come, and uh, and and over the course of um, uh, ch because of the environmental change that we've made, so because we can control our day length, because we can control the concentration of light and how it's dispersed over the year by just um, turning lights off and on in our environment, and um, and just keeping a light on at night, and and. Uh, not going just to bed when it gets dark, but and not being in tune with the rhythms of the day, but um, but uh, just artificially manipulating our environments and also in controlling the temperature to make it uniform all year. And uh, so what they have evidence is that um, it's these genes that predispose us to depression, but the depression is not present unless we are artificially manipulating our environment in these ways. And what they argued is that uh, for people who are of pure African descent, they do not have any means. And so they do not have any of these genes We adapted them for sort of conquering these, um, you know, and coping with and dealing with and readying themselves for these changes over the course of the year. And uh, so ironically, I live in Canada and, and uh, it, it does seem to me, just anecdotally, that the people who don't seem to get into depression, uh, they, they get cold in the winter, but they don't seem to get depressed. It, it is, you know, the people that I know that are of African descent. Now, you know, that's just um, uh, neither here nor there. But, um, but yeah, there, there is some scientific evidence for this, that that is the root cause of it. And because our, we are artificially manipulating our environments to a greater and greater degree, all the time, um, that is what's predis and because we have these genes that we inherited through these matings with Neanderthals 100,000 years ago, that is the, the root cause of, um, of our depression. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing that. I was not aware about these uh, studies. I would love to read them. I don't know if you could share them in the chat maybe or somewhere else. Gosh, I do not have those at hand. It was just something that, you know, when you go down a rabbit's hole and one study leads to another. And uh, so that was, gosh, it was about four years ago okay. now that I that I went down that rabbit hole, so I don't know where they are. But yeah, I'm sure you can Google it. And find yeah, I'll, I'll definitely try to find that. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, maybe it will be valuable, Ian, to Paul, because um, he has uh, a five-year target to finish his study on this. It will be contributory, maybe. Thank you. So we have uh, uh, Byron uh, here on stage. Byron, welcome to the stage. Hello, y'all. Oh, Hello. Uh, please come near Hello. the mic. I may not be speaking. Hold on. 
So, Paul, while we are waiting for Byron to come back, I just want to ask you, you said that you wanted to, you are trying to recruit PhDs for your lab. What are the qualifications of the PhDs that you want to recruit? And I just posted in the chat a reference to what uh, Alma was, or um, uh, what someone was talking about with respect to um, Neanderthal genes and depression. So I put that in the chat. Perfect. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, so the uh, the main uh, uh, the main qualification is somebody that loves science. <laughs> but it would be great if it's somebody with um, experience in chronobiology, uh, neuroscience, uh, and or metabolism. Yeah, thank you. I'll spread the word. And uh, yeah, we have Yellow, we have Byron again here on stage. Byron? Can y'all hear me now? Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Um, so I just had some feedback that I was going to give. Uh, I'm, a night, I'm a night owl. I have been for a very long time. Uh, um, probably starting probably around puberty at least, if not before. Actually, before, yeah. I used to stay up at night and watch the highway, watch the watch the cars pass by on the highway. Um, uh, I guess that was probably about six years old or so, maybe five. So I'm a night owl. It's, it's a natural thing. I'm also I've also developed an alert allergy to sunlight over the years through heat injuries and stuff like that where I'm uncomfortable in the light anymore. Not only that, I have, my eyes are highly photosensitive where light, um, light affects me, uh, very greatly. In fact, I, I can become intoxicated walking through a muse, a, a art gallery or an art museum. If I spend too each time in an art museum, I can become intoxicated just from the different um, uh, saturations of color. So I, I'm just um, dropping some of those on there just to let you know there may there may be some subtle complexities to this. Uh, I'm a more comfortable. My my eyes are more comfortable in moonlight. I have very good uh, night vision moonless or with the moon I've just it was something that was uh, noticed from my troop leaders when I was in scouts early on and exclamated upon um, so there may be and I, I, the reason I bring these up is because we as human species we are also uh, warlike and um the male population of the species has been traditionally um, sacrifice, been sacrifices to combat, uh, and so some of these some of these genetic threads that may um, diversify our our human genome may just not be in existence anymore, in a sense, because they were. Uh, because they were lost in battle before they had any children. So um, I mean, I, these are just some uh, curiosities that I wanted to comment on, and I was wondering if you had any response to any of that that I just dropped on there. No, this is the first time uh, uh, I hear anybody having a condition like that. I mean, we're, uh, as a species, we are diurnal but we do have uh, night owls but they usually don't stay up only when it's dark but they just go to bed a little bit uh, later but of course there are extremes uh, everywhere like Bob sleeping three hours and may, uh, yeah I'm not aware about any study that have shown this but maybe there was some population 
uh, in history that have been, or some groups of individuals that have been nocturnal human populations. So yeah, not that I'm aware of, but thanks for sharing. Uh, Byron, I had a question for you. Can you tie this to your circadian rhythm in some way? Uh, yeah, my, I actually am healthier whenever I wake up about, let's just say, an hour or two before sunset. And like my, my normal depressive cycle, I have a, my depressive cycle, it, uh, I, wake, I like to wake up maybe about five or six in the evening and stay up till about 10 in the morning is what I prefer. Clubhouse hasn't been helping me with that. And I also have, I've got a hyper, I, unfortunately I have a, like this hypervigilance uh, um, trigger. So sometimes uh, I'll, sl I'll, I'll just skip circadian cycles and then I'll like, um, then I'll do like three hours of sleep every 40 hours or so uh, just to get back into rhythm. But um, yeah, I mean, I, how can I tie my circadian rhythm is, is just like 6 p.m. to 10 a.m. is where I'm comfortable and where I get the, when I'm most productive. Even when I'm working in the shop or whatever, I prefer to work all evening and all night. I think it's got to do more with um, my discomfort with natural sunlight for my, my eyes. Right. Uh, and... and right. You know? Yeah, I mean, uh, because it could be, yeah, no, I mean, it could be that you have a, let's say, normal circadian clock, a normal molecular clock. It's just that you avoid light and you're comfortable in moonlight, and the moonlight is enough for your clock to be synchronized, and then you're synchronized to these, to the lunar rhythms instead. Um, do, do you experience? Uh, oh. Yeah, go ahead. I had one more thing I wanted to, I was wondering if you uh, were considering instead of just natural light, when we say natural light, the electromagnetic emissions coming from the sun that um, our body encounters while the sun is in the sky compared to moonlight, uh, have you looked at maybe the magnetic effect of uh, being of a day cycle compared to a night cycle and those combinations there within absent of light, uh, light or not just uh, um, pursuing uh, the fluctuation in the uh, possible like uh, magnetic pull or um interaction between the sun and uh the study subject yeah and not that's just a, very interesting there is no studies uh, on that uh, at least not non no in high impact journals uh, but i think if somebody would be able to show that it would have the the paper or the study would have had a a paradigm shift defect that's a very interesting uh, uh, hypothesis that you have there if yeah haven't i haven't thought about it it's uh, outside of my um scope for these coming five years but who knows maybe after that Yeah, I saw some comments of Annie on the um, room chat. So I don't know if Annie would like to come up the stage and uh, yeah, speak. So I'm trying to invite her. Otherwise, uh, Bob can maybe read some comments. Okay, I, I have something very interesting from Elizabeth. Depression is required for hibernation, but is not conductive to, cannot sustain cooperative aggression, the hallmark of homo sapiens. It means, 
it means of colonization and mass extinction. And she states a Scientific American article. And I, I think this factors in a little bit, although we're getting apart from the, uh, the circadian rhythms a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the depression is there for a, for a reason. And um, it, yeah, it is a coping strategy. So there, yeah, I, uh, the link to, I mean, there is also other biological rhythms that uh, like hibernation that uh, uh, might be, I mean, it just, uh, I think she confirms the link between biological rhythms and mood. There is, there seem to be a link there that is, um, requires more investigation, definitely. Yes, so we have Eric who just came up. Uh, Eric, uh, sorry, I'm just catching up on the uh, on the on the uh, article here. So I'll have a question in a moment. Sorry, I came in late, but very very fascinated by the topic. Uh, I often think of uh, you know, uh, not only is uh, circadian uh, um, like the mechanisms are, are important to identify, and if we can correlate that or connect that with diets then we can move on from uh, predictive to perhaps even, uh, you know, the golden age or the supposed golden age of medicine is the prescriptive algorithms or uh, analytics. And so that would be an interesting, if there's any commentary in that direction, uh, uh, that would be uh, kind of the, the direction of my questions. But uh, thank you. Yeah, exactly. So that's exactly what my research, uh, the aim of my research is to first understand what is which metabolic pathways uh, and compounds in our body uh, are altered uh, temporarily altered with uh, different insults in our environment such as uh, untimely light exposure or activity and food intake and then wh which of these specific pathways are um, central for our health and then one could uh, eventually target these pathways specifically in individuals with disrupted circadian rhythms uh, in order to reverse disease progression. So that is the, the final goal. In terms of uh, circadian rhythm, there there was a um, well, maybe it's not circadian, but it has more to do with the um, mitochondria. How stimulating the mitochondria with red light uh, can actually help uh, restore some vision. And uh, personally, in experimenting with that kind of uh, technology myself, I've found that I'm actually more energetic and more primed and been able to better reset my schedule if I'm able to do this, you know, 20 minute red light therapy session in the mornings, uh, were there any sort of, uh, any, any clinical, uh, results that folks could take away? Uh, uh, I guess like maybe top two tips that they could perhaps apply from the intuitions or, um, notes that you gather from your study. Yeah, it would be, um, to, uh, I mean, for, uh, the, uh, it was, interesting they say red light because the blue light is the most potent synchronizer of our um, internal clock so for mitochondria it might might be uh, different um, but the uh, um, main factors that one should uh, uh, take into account is to have consistent um, exposure of bright light consistent feeding schedules and uh, be physically active. These factors synchronize our internal rhythms and maintain this metabolic coherence between of metabolism between our organs. One one uh, factoid that may be relevant is uh, I think it's true that red light is better transmitted through human tissue, and mitochondrial activation wouldn't make a lot of sense. For something that doesn't penetrate the uh, skin, 
and uh, whereas uh, red light does tend to penetrate uh, the body better, I believe that's um, a truth. Uh, there, there's a company um, led by Mary Lou Jepson using red light for whole body imaging because it's so well conducted. So um, I suspect that's a truism, and it would make sense that in clock synchronization coordinated by the brain that the optical pathways and the blue light would be preferential but if we're talking about mitochondrial activation which um, is global in all cell types then a red light may be a more important uh, a more effective cue just just a, a wild hypothesis yeah valid one I, I, I wanted to... I, add, oh, sorry. I just want to comment that I think early this year we had a guest in quantum photonics who talked about the, the red light therapy for mitochondria. John, I think he's from, she's from uh, UCLA. Yeah, yeah, that's actually what I'm referring to is a, is a past speaker. And uh, uh, upon hearing that, I actually was like, you know what, I'm going to try this. And now... And uh, not only does my wife do a red light therapy in the morning, so does my mom. Uh, my mom's friend uh, does it as well. Um, and it's strange because for me personally, I was doing blue light therapy before in the mornings, you know, because everyone said blue light is so useful. But my wife would get a headache from it, and I would not actually see that much benefit from it. And so um, seeing this study on the mitochondria specifically being able to use that energy or at least lift kind of the minimum binding energy perhaps it re raises the floor so the interactions perhaps are less uh, require less energy so you're kind of able to get moving more but just in general when we look at people in tropical climates with uh you know more uh i guess more red light uh and and more blue light we see benefits but then when we kind of move to the north uh we see less blue light and you would think adding blue light would help, but at least uh, anecdotally, I haven't seen it actually be as beneficial as red light. Um, so, so that's kind of been something that uh, that I've been experimenting with, curious about, um, and not really sure what to make of it. Because it would be great to develop a therapy or a protocol to say, hey, look, here's the reset. You know how we have control alt delete for computers. Perhaps there would be a great control alt delete for humans as well. Could somebody post that red light study uh, you're referring to? I'd, I'd love to see yeah, yeah, that. I, I actually, yeah, I'm pretty deeply involved, as many of you know, in the COVID space and research. And um, people with uh, mitochondrial impairments are suffering disproportionately. And it would be really interesting um, to think about red light therapy in people with known mitochondrial disease vis-a-vis -vis protection from and and recovery from uh, the ravages of COVID. Yeah, it would, I mean, it would be interesting as well to link the different um, uh, states that we see, I mean, in, in the sky from the sun uh, would explain some of the physiological effects sunset has as well that we don't know of right now. So yeah, please share. Yeah, and, and the other thing is that you know, the eye mediates everything through, in most cases, three rhodopsins that, you know, quantum capture the energy of a specific wavelength. And one would have, and there are many, many molecules that uh, capture photons um, and, uh, you know, excited electron states and so forth. So um, it, it would make sense that there are uh, mitochondrial uh, mutations that would either enhance or impair um, the red light effect that uh, obviously pre-existed red light therapy. Um, so that would be a whole fascinating line of research in uh, mitochondrial genetic disorders, knowing which uh, mutations might be associated with impairment, not just of mitochondrial function, but of light stimulation. Uh, vis-a-vis -vis the quantum mechanics of those, uh, the effect of those mutations on uh, um, uh, ingest ingesting that energy from a light wave. 
Yeah, no, I agree, definitely. Could I uh, inject something? I, I think there's a secondary function that's important here with red light. When blue light enters your eye, it causes your retina to dilate and you to squint. Red light does not do that, and that's the reason why uh, running lights at night on a ship are, are red for the navigator and people like that. And I, I think this has... Uh, serious potential for therapy. Yeah, I mean, the circadian field, there, I'm surprised that there is, hasn't been more research done on how different wavelengths influence. Uh, I mean, even if it's not uh, circadian rhythms for like regulation of the molecular clock, they could be um, direct rhythms that light has uh, that's also biological rhythms even if they're not circadian because they're not autonomous so definitely an area that should be studied more yeah and it was uh, 670 nanometers uh, specifically uh, which uh, was kind of funny at the time of the article coming out the price of the 670 uh, nanometer leds <laughs> the actual diodes went up uh, a little bit in price around that time as well. So, uh, but it's a very it's a very inexpensive and low cost thing. And apparently, just three minutes with uh, red light but it can help improve vision. Just three minutes in the mornings. So I've posted the link yeah, the chat here on the side for folks who want to check it out. But sorry about the tangent there for for light. But it seemed like a non-invasive or at least relatively non-invasive way of uh, helping reset that and, and and for myself i'm a cancer patient uh, who received chemotherapy had a quite invasive surgery so for me the mornings and the energy and also having had covid uh, i i really try to benefit as much as i can two percent here five percent here makes you know the difference between a good day and a bad day so really appreciate any research that kind of helps helps folks like myself yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. It is, uh, I mean, most of the uh, interventions that help uh, maintain our biological rhythms are quite inexpensive as well. So it's a, uh, it's a great way of maintaining good health, exercise, light exposure, and um, consistent food intake or feeding windows, that is. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, Micah here on stage, and uh, Amy tried to raise her hand a while ago, so I tried to bring her up, but I couldn't. So, yeah, I'm wondering what's the problem. Maybe Amy can go out of the room and come back again uh, to so that she could uh, go on stage. So we have uh, Micah here. Uh, Micah, would you like to speak? Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure. I always love the topics uh, in the room. Quantum photonics, you can't beat it, right? So with with the topic of red light therapy, you know, I use two different modalities. Um, one actually recycles the body's own near-infrared light, and, you know, these frequencies reset thousands of things that take place for the DNA. Um, you know, I love to... Uh, I can put the link in the chats. There's also a company uh, by Beamer, and I've been with the company a few years. It's a PEMF device, and they what they do is the red light is not available unless you're a medical doctor, but I do have the red light. I, I purchased it before, I guess, they uh, stopped giving it out to, uh, you know, everyone or allowed it to be purchased, but... It, it literally speaks Morse code to the DNA with with red light. Just amazing. So, um, you know, just two technologies I've used personally for health, performance, and I've, I've had a lot of my clients, you know, experience results right away from both of the different technologies. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Love the topic. Thank you. Thanks. Um, have, have any of your uh, students, I guess, uh, considered monetizing this as a sort of service, as a monitoring service or an algorithm that could be 
automated and say, hey, look, by the way, you know, you could have used better sleep or, or, or uh, implement this in any sort of, um, I guess, continuous system that can provide feedback to people. I, I'm sure Fitbit would love to uh, integrate this kind of uh, data or algorithmics into their services. So, yeah, you know, I mean, with the uh, with all the apps and the uh, smartwatches and everything we have, there is definitely plenty of room of, for developing. Uh, uh, yeah, algorithms or apps or whatever to uh, to help people maintain these rhythms. I mean, there's so much of our behavior that we're just not aware of. Most people, I mean, I, I would say no person, if you don't measure it, you, we don't really know how much light we're exposed to and what kind of light and at what times during the day. We just are and that's it. And now we have the uh, photo reset, I mean, our, uh, artificial photoreceptors that we can measure light exposure. We have those in the smartwatches, for instance. Just by having that and being aware of that would itself be uh, very beneficial. And what one could think that food intake that people are aware of when and how much they eat, but people are not really aware of that. We know that from decades of studies in nutrition, when you ask people what they ate, last day they have already forgot most of it and what times they so it's so much of our behavior and what we were exposed to that we we're not aware of and we have the technology technology to measure it so yeah there is um, if there is any entrepreneurs they should definitely dig deeper into that and <laughs> there's uh, a lot of potential Oh, I meant uh, more of what, uh, so there's an individual by the name of Jamie Mat My Metzel, and he uh, has discussed on several occasions the need for academics and researchers to sometimes take an entrepreneurial perspective, and that sometimes means encouraging your grad students to say, hey, look, uh, what if you turn this into a venture? So my question is more geared towards uh, members in your lab and perhaps prospective students or as you say entrepreneurs out there listening that they would team up and reach out to your lab and say hey you know what maybe we can put this into an algorithm and you know if we can just help one percent of people one percent of how many users Fitbit has that's a quite a significant contribution so I often think of the scaling of how human effort benefits from automation you know, uh, t 10 seconds here, you know, during the boot of a computer doesn't seem like much, but if you have 20 million users booting up a computer every day, you know, that actually amounts to quite a lot at the end of a year. Uh, that can be, you know, thousands of years of human life saved uh, just by a, a small change. And similarly here, so that was kind of a shout out there to the audience, anyone, uh, to reach out to Paul and... Uh, make things happen because i would love to see this in a fitbit app or or just any uh any app that hey look by the way here's some more detailed analytics it's backed by a study you know so uh, i i know fitbit does a premium service so uh fitbit if you're listening <laughs> yeah thanks a lot for putting it out there i i'm uh not at all against it the final goal is of course with my research to help people and improve public health so yeah if anybody have uh, have the expertise and knowledge on how to use this uh, knowledge to uh, make it available for the public you're welcome to contact me please yeah there was a, a platform that i came across yesterday it's called radar base it's available on github and it allows you to uh, kind of um, bring together various sorts of sensor data, uh, diagnostics data, and therefore draw inferences from that. So perhaps even integrating into that kind of platform for the folks over at Radar Base, here's another column of data where we can draw inferences from. And personally, uh, I had a lot of success with algorithms predicting disease. I was able to predict my own cancer within a month, whereas it took doctors, you know, something like 11 months to reason through the protocols. And so there's a lot of low hanging fruit and, uh, you know, things where we can easily save money. So, um, 
so yeah, that, that's all for me for now. I won't hog the mic. I'll pass it on to uh, other folks if anyone else has any other comments. But love this kind of stuff. Uh, Going to dive into the uh, replay after this. So my apologies for missing it. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you, Eric. You... Yes, yeah, so uh, who was speaking? Um... Yeah, I just wanted to mention, you know, with you being able to predict your own illnesses, yeah, that that's where some of the technology can be dangerous because there are frequencies that are known to, you know, um, allow cancer. And, you know, when it comes to health, uh, you know, some of us are looking at, you know, basically using frequencies to to promote health, healthy biology. But a lot of these software devices that capture your data, you know, sometimes that can be dangerous because a lot of companies will store data and monetize that data in the future so um, yeah it's great technology but I think it can be dangerous in one regard because you know the information is out there we know what frequency will stop cancer we know what frequency will cause cancer and other disease so uh, so I'm not sure what you mean by frequency but I think uh, to be a little bit generous I would agree that we know some things can cause cancer. I'm not sure what you mean by uh, frequencies cause cancer. Um, I think that is perhaps a very uh, loaded and perhaps contentious statement. If you want to, we could perhaps dive into it in another room. But uh, uh, to in, in respect to the speaker, uh, I have to unfortunately object to that kind of language, uh, even though I'm enthusiastic about uh, inference and prediction. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. I understand what you're saying. But, uh, yeah, that information is out there. Cancer gives a certain frequency, uh, and it also is, um, you know, limited by other frequencies. So, yeah, I respect what you said. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have um, Simed who, um, who wanted to, who raised his hand, but I could not bring him up the stage. So, yeah, um, maybe you can, are you on stage already, Simon? Hi, Cecilia. Yeah, oh, great. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, I <clears throat> thank you, first of all, for the subject. I love the, I love the level and uh, all the information and stuff that you shared on this topic. So, for my side, I, I have an illness, we can say, so for now for more than 10 years. I have an extreme sensitivity to the blue light. So regarding the screens and uh, even the lamps, the artificial lighting, so I, I can't, I can't support them more than uh, I can say two minutes, three minutes. I, I start having headaches and uh, so I did a lot of research uh, during these ten years to try to find a solution and change my food diet, all of that, trying to find what the solution for that. But until now, I didn't find really a solution for that. So as ex expert in this room, I would love to hear your their feedback about that but also all the reflection from the lights like if they have shiny things like even mirrors windows all of that i i, I can't stand uh, being uh, in front of that i didn't have this when i was born i can say so maybe over the, the years it, it got worse so the more exposed the more i i had this intolerance or this uh, sensitivity but yeah during this uh, last year so it became really handicapped handicapping I can't work with computers anymore, only the phone and uh, yeah, so it's getting a little bit uh, complicated and uh, it's, uh, it's handicapping, we can say. So thank you for your feedback. Yeah, it, 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 thanks for sharing that. It's uh, something with the, we know that happens with aging is that you uh, lose in your retina some of the metabolized compounds that um, filter the blue light so I mean I uh, I know what is happening in your case but that could definitely be a possibility if you've identified blue light as the causing factor it could be that you're lacking the filters uh, in your retina that uh, uh, that filter out some of the blue light and that you're hypersensitive to the blue light Maybe it's worth, there are glasses and what could buy the filters away, uh, blue light. Maybe it's worth trying those and see if you can 
uh, tolerate that more. Yes, so, um, uh, Paul, um, you know, I usually remind our speakers when they're uh, here at an hour and a half, but we're here for yeah almost two hours now. So, um, how much more time do you have for us? I just saw a comment at the room chat, maybe that I would like to. Okay, yeah. Maybe I, we can listen to that comment, and then I think I'll. Uh, unfortunately, it's been a very interesting discussion, and I've learned a lot. So I would love to continue, but maybe one more comment, and then uh, we'll wrap you it got, up. You got to get on Twitter. So uh, I just tweeted out this room, uh, mentioning that thing about Fitbit. And sometimes, you know, companies will reach out. Sometimes uh, you can find somebody. So definitely having a social media presence for labs, which seems counterintuitive. And Twitter, of all places, you wouldn't think is hot for biotech or, or, or bio. But in fact, it is. In fact, there's a story that I'll just share quickly. I remember around the time of the gun debates last year uh, in the U.S., uh, a bunch of researchers, I guess, folks in medicine were like, well, guns are a medicine issue, but they couldn't obviously discuss it online without some sort of political uh, fallout. And so instead of saying big guns or big industry, big data, they used the term big lettuce. And they said, you know, uh, <laughs> so they, they said funny things like, you know, uh, this is happening for that reason, but, you know, that's something that big lettuce doesn't want you to know. So... There's a lot of humor, but also a lot of opportunity for uh, scientific labs on Twitter. So uh, definitely make sure you, uh, at some point, look into that. Highly, uh, highly encourage that. But uh, that's all. Yeah, no, I, I am on Twitter. So yeah, I. Um, it's uh, oh, okay. at it's, Paul it's, underscore. Yeah, Pedro. so I would recommend connecting it to your. Um, account here so that if uh, if uh, I'll, I'll tweet it out again, I'll make sure to tag you. Uh, so uh, just give me that uh, tw Twitter handle in a moment. But uh, it automatically allows a post to be shared and it tags you automatically. So it automates that process. Okay. So it would, uh, uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I'll link it to this uh, once we're done here. So thanks for doing yeah, yeah. that. If you could just post it on the side chat or direct message me, uh, then. Uh, I'll make sure to uh, add it into the Twitter uh, post. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, so there there was a comment from Tara on the room chat, but I could not see it now. But uh, I remember that the comment was about the link, uh, supposedly link between uh, dementia and exposure to light. So, yeah, I just want to say that whether you have a comment or not, uh, that's okay too. But... Uh, um, I just want to announce this to the room before we start to wrap up. Yeah, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson, there is so much linked to the circadian clock and uh, also interestingly to metabolism. So suffering from obesity or diabetes also increases the risk of uh, uh, developing Alzheimer's. And maybe it is, uh, again, the circadian or yeah, circadian rhythms that are the common denominators linking, linking these two. So definitely something that also needs more research. As you hear, a lot of these, uh, this topic is very young and immature. And uh, yeah, it, it would be exciting digging deeper into this. Uh, yeah, uh, previous to this room, we had uh, a room uh, from a researcher in Mayo Clinic and uh, I think it's uh, it would be great if you would also listen to that because uh, I think you will be getting some more inspiration on your on furthering your research about the um, circadian rhythm. Um, yeah, so he he is uh, um, having a research about uh, chimer chim rhythm and somasonic cells. So, but uh, I think I mm -hmm. I just have a feeling that um, you will have an inspiration based on his uh, study also in link to your study. So anyway, uh, yeah, I think we will wrap up because it's also getting late on the side of Paul. We, the, it is a very, very enjoyable chat um, with him uh, this time. And uh, we hope that we can invite uh, 
you back, Paul, here in Quantum Photonics to have, you know, just like an open discussion. Maybe we can be part of your ideation in your lab sometimes because you see we have a mixed audience here. And uh, uh, members of Quantum Photonics, they have a lot of imagination and they, of, of course, read a lot. So, um yeah, I think I think yeah. I've learned uh, I learned more than the audience here. I really enjoy uh, being here. It's been great, great comments and uh, see people asking questions from a completely different uh, perspective. Sometimes you get isolated in the field in your own field, where the same um, ideas and uh, uh, questions are just repeated over and over again. So this is. Uh, it is great, and uh, I develop a lot by coming here. So thanks to everybody in the audience, especially the ones that asked questions. Yeah, just be careful, though, because it can get addictive. You may find yourself huddled over in front of your phone in your bathroom, sitting on your toilet seat, talking quietly at 3 o'clock in the morning while the rest of your family... It's, it's too late. It's too late. I'm already addicted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, yeah. It will affect your your um, your circadian rhythm. Your no. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Oh, you be careful. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, please take care of your adjustment to your circadian rhythm while you are in clubhouse. So, um, yeah, um, thank you again, Paul. Um, and I would like to announce the upcoming room that we will have in the evening. We will be having a guest from the University of Michigan, and um, he will be speaking about visualizing nanoscale structures in real time. So please don't miss this room um, in the evening at uh, uh, 6 p.m. PDT. And... Um, we will be having um, another room um, tomorrow evening as well. Um, th we will have a guest from OpenAI. So this is a major research, actually. And it took me about uh, two months to be able to bring this um, guest on stage because he had to ask for clearance from OpenAI to speak about this paper. So uh, please check this out. The title of the room is Evolution Through Large Models. Yeah, this is all maybe that I will announce. These are the next two rooms that I will announce. But we have uh, maybe two or three more major rooms before uh, the, the weekends uh, from major researchers. There's another AI researcher from Microsoft who's coming in with also a major paper. So please follow Quantum Photonics. And yeah, please be here to share that discussion with us. And uh, uh, Paul, uh, we are very grateful for your coming here and for your staying for a long time and the great engagement with the audience. We are also um, thankful to those who are here on stage, Bob, Shera, Jan, Alma, LT, Yellow, um, Eric, of course, uh, Micah, Simed, and yeah, Ryan, who came back. And everyone in the audience, I cannot mention you all, but thank you so much for having been here, especially those who had stayed from the start and until now. So yeah, it's time to call up uh, on stage, Darcel, please come up to help us in the countdown. Mike, to you, Darcel. Thank you, Cecile, and thank you, Doctor, for a great talk. Um, I really learned a lot, and I'm, I'm motivated to get more sunshine now, to get out more as a creative. I'm usually huddled up creating, so that, that I'm definitely on board with that. So that being said, we're going to get you out of here because I know it's late. Uh, we're going to do a short count from five to close the room is everybody ready 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 <laughs> five five, five. five. four four <laughs> three. three and a third Thirty-three. <laughs> go second two go second good doctor paul Call out our final number. Okay, one. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, see you back Thank here you, soon. Um, have a good night. Thank you. You too. Yeah, thank you. See you in the next rooms and please visit us. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Everybody here. Bye. Yes, uh, thank you.